My name is Lucas Wright. I recognize some of your names, which is great. I'm a senior educational consultant at the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology. And I've been I've been really obsessed with generative AI. My my previous work was all around learning technology and how faculty, staff, and students teach and learn using learning technology. I think when Gen AI isn't new, but when ChatGPT 3.5 emerged and really caught folks' attention. Um, I really got obsessed with it, started researching a little bit, started doing a lot of workshops. So I've had the opportunity to do some research and workshops throughout UBC, throughout other institutions. So I hope to bring you today some of the results of that obsession and experimentation. I don't see myself as an expert, um, but someone who's maybe a couple months ahead from some of you. And a reminder that today's an introductory session. So the purpose of se today's session was to help folks who haven't had a chance to do much with generative AI yet, um, develop their skills and start to get to know it. Um, that's why we created the Gen AI 101 session. So welcome everyone. And what I'm gonna get you to do just to kind of get to know the group is we're going to do a quick vote in the chat. And the purpose of this is just to get to understand where everyone's at with generative AI right now in education. So to do that, don't do it yet. But in a moment, what I'm going to ask you to do is to enter either the number one two or three in the chat. And what I'd like you to do is if you have no experience with generative AI, very limited experience, put a one in the chat. If you've been playing with it a little bit, have some experience in your teaching, put a two in the chat. And if you're really experienced, I see a couple folks here actually have expertise in computation linguistics, put a three in the chat. So just to kind of get a read on the room. So go ahead now. So we got a couple twos, a couple threes, a couple ones. So a real mix. I think the more I do these workshops, we're moving more into the two area. And um, yeah, thanks for doing that. So let's jump into the workshop now. So welcome to Generative AI 101. And before we move into the workshop, I want to acknowledge that I'm coming today from Port Moody, which is on traditional Kwikwitlam, Salua tooth. Um, land. I also live near a railway cutback, so I'm really conscious what the Trutch administration did uh, using the railways to cut reserve lands down. So this is a one-hour session, and in this session I'm going to start with an introduction to Gen AI in education, start kind of moving you into it. Talk about Gen AI as a co-collaborator for developing teaching materials and end off with three ways Gen AI is being used or can be used in education. What I encourage you to do is to follow along. I've created a worksheet. Um, let me actually remove that QR code because the QR code is inaccurate but I've created a worksheet for this session. And the idea behind the worksheet is I think the best way to understand the Gen AI in the context of education is to play with it and to experiment with it. So I encourage you to open the bit.ly that I put in there, which is bit.ly Gen AI 101. And I've included all of the prompts that I've mentioned as well as all of the resources that I've mentioned. So you may want to have a tool open and kind of go through, play along with me as we go, just to get a feeling for it. In terms of tools and resources, this is an ever-changing area, as many of you know. Um, yesterday, OpenAI introduced uh, Chat GPT for Omega, which is the last link on there. And this is a really fascinating change because what it's doing is bringing a higher quality generative AI tool to everyone without having a paywall. So by logging into ChatGPT now, you can access for 
zero, some call it a very poorly named Gen AI, um, Omega. And with that tool, you'll be able to create text, images, and use voice. And it's benchmarking similar to ChatGPT 4.0. In addition, you may want to use ChatGPT 3.5 or Bing Chat, which is called MS Copilot. A reminder, at currently at UBC, only ChatGPT 3.5 and MS Copilot have completed a privacy impact assessment. What that means is in your classes, you can have students use those tools responsibly, meaning you still don't want them to put in any private information. However, they can use them without login. So it's a little bit more safeguarded in terms of privacy. You also may want to click along with Google Gemini. I use Gemini Advanced as well. Um, it's really up to you. Each tool has its strengths. Keep in mind that ChatGPT 3.5 and MS Copilot are going to be far less accurate and far more difficult to get accurate results than ChatGPT 4.0 for Omega or Google Gemini Advanced. So what is generative AI? And I'm just going to put this example from Wikipedia here or this definition, and I'll give you a moment to read it. So Gen AI has uses complex text prediction to predict the next word or multiple words in a sentence. And this is really important to know because it's very easy to endow wisdom on these tools, um, but understanding that they are at their heart using complex word prediction or token prediction. The data that they're using is fairly interesting and it's worth taking a look at in your own time. I think the last place we were getting really clear indicators of what data was used was ChatGPT 3.5 is really clear about the data used. ChatGPT 4, Google Gemini is a little bit less clear about what data they use to train their models. ChatGPT 3.5 is quite fascinating, though. It uses a database called Common Crawl, which is a web archive going back about 13 years. It's not an archive of the whole web. It's an archive of select websites, and these have been scraped. So if you've used tools like Reddit, if you've created your own website, if you've created a departmental website, much of this data has been scraped. Secondly, ChatGPT 3.5 uses all of the Wikipedia data for its responses. And thirdly, a fairly controversial database called Books 3 is used by ChatGPT 3.5. And Books 3 has about 187,000 books within its database. A lot of those books are copyrighted. And just to kind of test this out, pick your favorite book ask it to create a worksheet. If you've written a book, ask it to create a worksheet based on the book you've written. It doesn't have all the books, but ChatGPT does have access to many books. And there's multiple lawsuits going on right now around those books. And just to let you know, as we go through, I didn't mention this at the start, this workshop, I'm gonna be talking through some things. I'm also gonna give you a chance to play as we go through the workshop, run some prompts, try these tools out. So we'll pause as well. There are significant issues with these tools. And just to kind of give you an example of that, and the reason that I like to do these workshops, and I think these workshops are really important right now at universities, is an experience that I had teaching teacher candidates at UBC about ChatGPT in January. So we got partway through the workshop. We had folks create some AI art. We hadn't got to the issues yet. And there was a number of art teachers in the class. And they said, why are you doing this? Why are you having us create AI art? We're offended by this. It's destroying creators. It infringes on intellectual property. I'm not sure I agree with their perspective, but 
it is worth knowing that there are a lot of challenges with these tools right now. And that that got me reflecting on why I think these workshops are important. And that's what Maha Bali, who's an academic out of the University of Cairo, calls critical Gen AI literacy. So I think by exploring the capabilities of these tools, by playing with these tools, we can have a conversation about them. And I think as academics, as university staff, as university faculty, you are the right people to be having these conversations. It's too easy for Silicon Valley or different areas like that to be the primary area for these conversations. And I think the more people who can build some capability and critically look at these tools, these technologies as they develop, the more that we can focus on their ethical use. So a couple issues. Um, I'm gonna get a thumbs up if you've, this is gonna date myself and it may date you if you put your thumb up. Can I get a thumbs up if you've seen the 1984 movie with Matthew Broderick called War Games? Let's see if I only date myself here. Yeah, Doug says yes. So at least someone from my generation, Garrett, says yes. And for 10 points, Doug or Garrett, can you, would you mind unmuting yourself and letting us know how they managed to break the AI at the end of the movie? Jeez, it's been probably 15 years since I've seen it. So <laughs> I, I don't recall. It's been a long, long time. Garrett, you want to take a stab? I'm afraid I'm going to have to give a similar answer. It's been a while since I've seen the movie. All right. Um, they the the AI was about to cause nuclear war, and so they asked it to play tic tac toe against itself. And it, as it started to play tic tac toe itself, it realized there was no solution. It couldn't win against itself, and it broke. And I, I just wanted to share that as a lead in to this hack that recently happened this is about three months ago with chat gpt a google engineer asked it to repeat the word palm forever and it didn't repeat the word palm forever what it did instead is started sharing personal information from its login database so i'm bringing this up because these tools are really vulnerable right now in terms of privacy. It reminds me a little bit of the early days of the web when there was a lot, there's still lots of privacy issues on the web, but there was this bigger vulnerability. And I think coupled with that, we know that there's a lot of institutional data going into these tools right now. We know there's a lot of university data. We know there's a lot of student data. We know there's a lot of personal data. I've mentioned in these workshops before, I had some challenges over Christmas and used ChatGPT as a counselor. Would I want that data to get out? No. Did I use it? Yeah, it was convenient. So I think right now we really need to think about the privacy in these tools. Right now at UBC, the Bing or MS Copilot Gen AI has an enterprise license. So it's going to be the most private of these tools, but keeping in mind privacy of what we put into them and kind of a good thought experiment to do with this would be, would I be okay if this leaked? Would I be okay if someone else got a hold of this email that I wrote, these names I put in, this data I put in? And this is from the UBC CTLT website, and it kind of goes over the two tools that do have privacy impact assessments. This does not mean that students should put private information into them, but it does mean that you can recommend their use, their responsible use in the classroom. So currently we have ChatGPT 3.5 and MS Copilot. Um, I expect more tools will be here as we can continue on, but currently these are the key tools that you can recommend. Accuracy and responsibility. On the right-hand side, you'll see a diagram from UNESCO, a flowchart that talks about when it's safe to use generative AI. And I really like their first question. Does it matter if the output is true? No. 
well, it's probably safe to use. Yes. Do you have the expertise to validate to verify that the output is accurate. And this can get quite challenging. I think as academics, a lot of you have expertise and you may have the only expertise in the area that can completely validate the output. So these tools are 70 to 80% accurate and 100% confident. And that means that it's a really challenging space. Today I was using Google Gemini to I use it, I put a URL in and I have it write citations and annotations for articles I put in. The first time it got the citation right, but did the annotation wrong because I had already read the article. The second time it actually gave me the wrong article based on the URL. It, it told me it was a different author and a different article title. So I think we need to get used to using um, what some researchers call evaluative judgment and use our evaluative judgment to verify output. And we're seeing people get into significant issues with this already. <clears throat> so the top example I've shared there was from Australia, where a group of academics decided to submit a um a paper critiquing some of the big consultancy firms to the Australian Senate. And one of the firms was KPMG. They use Google Bard to help generate the report and they didn't fact check. And you can imagine what happened. The KPMG lawyers got into it and found that it was full of inaccuracies and realized it had been produced by Gen AI. The academics were reprimanded. There's been a BC lawyer who's been reprimanded for citing fake cases that were developed by ChatGPT. And this isn't the first time that this has happened in the context of law. So I think as these tools get used more and more, we need to think about what responsible use means. The final example is a little bit different. At Vanderbilt University, a group of deans wrote a letter with chat GPT to the students to discuss a mass shooting that happened at another university. At the bottom of the letter, it says created with chat GPT. The students were furious and the deans were suspended, I think, for a few days because the students felt that they were being very inauthentic by doing this. We're also seeing these tools creep into research. Um, there's a database now that's on GitHub, I think, that has all of the different research papers that have either been retracted or critiqued for using generative AI. How did they find them? They created scripts which searched for keywords like generated with chat GPT and things like that. So this isn't even using wording, et cetera. It's just people making mistakes and it was infiltrating multiple research articles. I tried to do an image of dogs playing poker with Gen AI. This is using Dolly 3. And I want to talk a little bit about capabilities. And I think with ChatGPT 4 Omega, we're going to see another jump in capabilities, capabilities that are available to the general public. <clears throat> a lot of the early papers and a lot of people's, when I do workshops, a lot of people's understanding of the capabilities are still based on the free versions of these tools, specifically ChatGPT 3.5. And what we're seeing is um, with models like ChatGPT 4.0 and Gemini Advanced, as well as some of the Claude models, we're seeing a huge jump from these models. I think as um, Ethan Mollick, who's a professor at Wharton University says, using ChatGPT 3.5, is like having a student assistant helping you. Using ChatGPT 4.0 is like having a PhD student helping you. So these are very different. And just to give you an example, this uh, diagram here shows how these tools did on a standardized exams. There's been some questions around some of these studies lately, and I'll mention that in a second. But to give you an example, on the standard law bar exam, ChatGPT 3.5 scored in the 20th percentile. 
chat GPT-4 scored in the 67th percentile. This chart shows 90th percentile. That's actually been retracted recently. So really big difference between those tools. Um, we've also seen these tools being very effective in things like critical reflection. Lee et al. in the context of pharmaceutical science had students write a critical reflection based on a prompt, had Gen AI write the same critical reflection. Stu the Gen AI, they were then evaluated and the evaluators didn't know which was which. Gen AI achieved higher than the students across the board and the evaluators weren't able to differentiate AI generated versus student generated. So we're at a point that in many cases, it's going to be very difficult and more and more difficult for us to differentiate student work from Gen AI work. There are exceptions to this, but in many cases. And what we know so far is as of now, AI checkers are not working very well. In the most recent study I saw, they were only able to determine AI generated work in 36% of the time. And that number went down to 28% when the researchers tried to uh, hide the fact they were using Gen AI. Human checking also is not that successful in many cases. And my concern about human checking is right now, Reddit is full of people <laughs> who are really upset about being accused of using Gen AI when they said they didn't use it. In addition, we're getting a lot of faculty who think that they're seeing Gen AI, when I think in many cases what they're seeing is poor use of Gen AI. Some students are really better at prompting these tools and using more sophisticated tools and what they're putting in may go under the radar. This isn't across the board in some STEM disciplines, particularly in math, I think Gen AI has proven to be a lot less effective than in art subjects and writing subjects. So what are we to do in terms of academic integrity? I think there's two approaches right now. One is communication. And in every student panel that I've talked to or I've listened to, a key aspect for them about Gen AI is that the use of Gen AI is communicated with them. When can they use it? What assignments can they use it for? How can they use it? And when can't they use it? And being really clear about that with them. Secondly, is starting to look at assessment redesign, which as many of us have just been through a pandemic and had to redesign assessment to make it more flexible and more online, this is a big lift and a big ask right now. So what a Gen AI resilient assignments or assessments look like right now? And I will say right now, because this is changing quite quickly. Number one is we know that to an extent in-class elements are a way to make an assessment more resilient. So this could be from, you know, going from having an exam adjudicated in person to having part of an assessment done in the classroom. For example, students might use a flipped classroom approach where they engage with a video or they engage with AI outside a classroom, then they come to the class and they have to answer questions in a group using a clicker. Or they might have to do some uh, activities where they write an essay outside of class and then they do discussion around it. Secondly is, and this is one that's changing quite quickly, especially with ChatGPT for Omega, is multimodal assignments or different ways of knowing. So having students submit audio, having students submit video, having students do presentations. So thinking of different modalities of expression outside of writing. Number three is context. So I think very specific contexts like classroom context may make these tools more resilient. I was just doing a presentation for the School of Population and Public Health, and they mentioned that really cutting edge niche research may not have been scraped by these tools as well, but that doesn't mean that students can't enter the research themselves into the tool and have the 
tools or technologies transform it. And then interviewing. And I think this brings up one of the challenges of these tools is academic integrity is part of it, but scale is also part of it. We have an opportunity to interview our students when they do assignments, talk through the assignments with them. Um, in the K-12 system, this is quite common. But again, this becomes a scale problem. I've heard in some departments what they've done is randomize classes and after an exam phone particular students and had them work through problems. Um, this can be another way of thinking about it. But you know, the other piece around academic integrity is what I'm learning from the student panels is that in depending on the pinch point they're caught in, the year they're caught in, many students aren't using these tools to cheat. They really are focused on their learning, but this is really going to depend on the context. Um, could I get a thumbs up if you recognize this image, Theater d'Opera Special? Does anyone want to unmute themselves and share the significance of this image? Okay, this was generated by AI. Um, and it won an art competition, I think, in 2023. It was significant at the time because it wasn't able to receive copyright. But why I find this image is fascinating is in the articles I was reading about it, they mentioned that the creators of the image spent more than a week of prompting to get this image. And that's significant because, again, as of right now, prompting makes a huge difference in the output quality of these tools. I say as of right now, because very quickly, prompting, I expect for many of us will be going away. I'm seeing more and more tools that just use fields that you fill out, or the new anthropomorphic tool actually writes the prompt for you. But as of now, prompting makes a big difference in the output. So this is a model I put together based on some research as well as some other models for prompting. And it's just so a good guidance to some effective prompting. There's lots of approaches to effective prompting. This is just one to keep in mind. So I called this the actor model for Gen AI prompting. I did use generative AI. Generative AI is really good at developing acrostics and mnemonics. I used it to help me do that. So the first piece is assigning a persona. By assigning a specific persona to these technologies, to these models, we find that we get better output. And I think we it's also a really creative way of doing these tools. So ACT as a PhD student is going to get you a very a higher quality output than ACT as a first year undergraduate student. ACT as an expert in X is going to get you a higher quality output, but you can have fun with this. One of my favorite prompts to use, I, I, I create a lot of workshop and activities with these technologies. Um, one of my favorite prompts to use is ACT as a cynical faculty member and evaluate this workshop. And the word cynical, just creates the most incredible responses. It's allowed me to redesign a lot of my workshops completely, but it's amazing to see what that one word will do. Number two is construct your output. Um, you can really play with the output format. So that can be from telling it to write something concisely, telling it to write something briefly, telling it to explain something like your five, so a very simple output, to the format, asking it to output something in CSV, asking it to output in different uh, coding languages. So really playing with the output. Number three is tailoring details. The more specific we are with details, the more effective our uh, prompt's going to be. And to give you an example of this, I'm a paddle boarder and I, I grew up in a town called Atlin, BC, biggest natural lake in British Columbia, it's 70 miles long, really wide, really dangerous for paddleboarding. And I asked ChatGPT where I could paddleboard on Atlin Lake. I just said, where can I paddleboard on Atlin Lake? And it said, oh, just go across to the glacier. You can't do that. You would die on your, you know, it wouldn't be a good experience, put it that way. 
but then I asked it act as a expert guide in paddleboarding and tell me how I can travel across Atlan Lake with First Island as my starting point. With those details, it was able to tell me not to, it said, don't go across the lake. You're going to need to go down the lake to the south. So it, it generated a much more specific response. So garbage in, garbage out really applies to prompting with these tools. Next is offering examples. You can train the models a little bit using your own examples. So if you write a learning objective, share some specific uh, learning objectives that you want it to use. Um, as its model to develop further learning detected learning um, exam learning objective examples and then reflect and refine. Um, studies have shown that by asking the model to show its work, the output tends to be more accurate. So saying things like tell me how you came up with that, explain your criteria can lead to more accurate output. Also consider doing a, a refinement loop. So for example, I'll have it generate a lesson plan. I'll say, act as a cynical faculty member, critique this lesson plan, what criteria did you use? Now, based on this critique, rewrite it. So by using these refinement loops, you tend to be able to refine your output. It's not perfect, but it's a way to improve it. I wanted to share briefly while we're on this introduction stage, the growth of custom bots. So this is an example of a GPT that I created. This is free. These are free for you to create or to use. If you go to chat GPT and log in, there's lots of custom bots that you can feed with your own data. So you can add data to it or add your own commands to it as well. Also, I'll just show you now with ChatGPT, um, let me just make sure I'm sharing the right screen here. There's a huge number of custom bots available for you. These are called GPTs. And again, these are only free as of yesterday. So if I start looking at custom bots, you'll see there's specific ones for writing, there's specific ones for scholarship, there are specific ones for productivity like Canva and Excel. Diagram.me will create diagrams. So these are all custom coded bots. If you're in the STEM disciplines, you'll see that there's Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram does computation linguist, lingu sorry. <laughs> Wolfram Alpha do, is a computation engine that allows you to do diagrams and computation. A question from Camila, please go ahead. Oh, she put her hand down. So we'll, we'll keep going. Please feel free to, did you have a question there, Camila? Sorry, can you hear oh, me now? Yeah, loud and okay. clear. Sorry, I had a problem with my microphone. No, I was just uh, curious about these chat bots. Um, are you able to um, upload information, let's say uh, documents, images, uh, with the different uh, bots? Let's say the DALI one, are you able to like upload any um any file basically yeah you're i let me just double check here i'm just on the bot now i'm assuming you're seeing that um yes you can upload files into it i don't know what the limit is in terms of how much you can upload into it um but you can upload files and have it use that file as well as chat gpt when it draws its data from it does that answer your question? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, please go ahead, Kasim. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering um, which version, because I'm looking on, I guess, GPT 3.5 and I'm not seeing the bots. Are you using four? So it this is the brand new um, change, right? So as long as you're logged into Chat G, OpenAI or Chat GPT, what you're going to get access now is to chat GPT for Omega 
And from my understanding, that should give you access to the bots. So if you see this chat GPT poorly named four zero or sorry, four O, you should have access to the GPTs and the GPT store. If you're using 3.5 without logging in, you won't have access to it. Thank you. Any other questions while we're here? Yeah, I have a question. I guess yeah. um, I don't really understand the difference uh, or the advantage of Omega. So you can access, I, I think I heard you say at the beginning that it was, um, it allowed you to kind of dabble with images and, and stuff like that. But yeah. So you don't have to pay for it. What would yeah. Be so a couple a couple advantages here. One is that so previously, Chat GPT four was only available if you paid for it, or you would have to use Chat GPT three point five, which was a lot less accurate mm -hmm. and had less functionality. As of yesterday or two days ago, Chat GPT came out with GPT four Omega which is available to anyone without pay. And that is benchmarking above or the same as ChatGPT4 for quality of output. What that means is you may know if you're paying for four now, you yeah. may not need to use it much longer. Secondly, previously to get access to these GPTs, you had to pay. Yeah. You know, for Now you don't, you get access to it with four Omega. Finally, um, it hasn't been released yet, but there's going to be a lot more multimodality with 4 Omega. So the ability to do things like read images, so using computer vision, uh, voice, et cetera, and they're just rolling that out now. Oh, so I guess it would make sense kind of to cancel the paid subscription. Perhaps. Or... I. Yeah, I would I'd be tempted. Well, what I'm my approach to it is I'm gonna play and I'm just gonna see yeah. where the where it's going for a little bit. And then okay. I will probably cancel my paid subscription, mostly because I have way too many paid subscriptions now to these tools. <laughs> the Agreed. developers have one. Okay, thanks, Lucas. What other questions do y'all have? We have a good chance to pause here. All right, I'm just gonna check the chat. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's uh, let's continue on here. Yeah, just a quick question. Yeah. Yeah, I just tried to um, change my 3.5 to four, but my registered uh, chat um, does not allow me to do because there is a kind of um, it, it needs to be paid so probably maybe I need to re you know re-register from uh, you know kind of a new person so then I could get the free one or is it uh, you know I'm I'm not sure what I can do is after we get off the call oh, drop okay. me an, drop me an email and I can poke around with that unless right. someone in the room knows the rules around that. This is fairly right. new. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So jumping in a little bit, and we're going to do an activity in a moment. Um, there's a great book, if you have a chance to read it, that just came out from Ethan Mollett called Cointelligence. And he talks about this idea of using generative AI as a co-creator. So being able to create with it. And I think in the context of teaching and learning, um, generative AI can really help us to do things like create assessments, create test banks, create rubrics, um, and kind of help us. Uh, David Wiley just wrote an article about this. Leave some space for us to work on other things within our teaching, active learning, mentorship, etc. So I just want to run a couple prompts with you. For those of you who haven't seen the output of these prompts, this is an example prompt that I'm doing. And I'm using the actor model for the prompt. See, I don't quite trust 4 Omega yet, 
I'm going to use 4.0 for this prompt. So you'll see I'm saying act as a political science professor and create 10 multiple choice questions tailored for first year political science students focusing on the fundamentals of Canadian parliamentary democracy. So very specific. I put an example question in there. I've given it a persona. And let's see the output we get from that. And if you want to improve your multiple choice questions, and generally what I do, I didn't do it in this case, is I like to go through the research in a particular pedagogical area. So for example, find someone who's written about writing good multiple choice questions, and I'll say write multiple choice questions like this person. And I find by doing that, I know it's pulling on a more specific perspective, and I'm also getting a higher quality output. Please go ahead, Camila. Uh, yeah, so a question just arose in terms of, does a chatbot, like a custom chatbot, replace a persona? Let's say you create a custom chatbot that is a political science professor and blah, 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 blah. Do you need to prompt it every time you use it? Or No, no. and yeah. that's, that's a great point is it, it reduces the need to, I think one of the, so two of the things that I think are really helpful about chatbots one is that you can customize it with your own data to an extent. Secondly, is you can put in a prompt that's going to have it already act as that persona, already call on those specific details. Mm -hmm. So whoever's the end user has to put a little bit less effort into the prompts they're using. Thanks. That's a good point. So here's the output that came out. And from there, we can copy paste it. Uh, we can regenerate it, we can read it aloud, or we can change the model. So one more example, and then I'll give you a few minutes to play. I think another area that these tools have come out as really strong is developing case studies and scenario. And that these are, what I love about this is we can develop scenarios. We can also build on them. So I could get it to create 20 case studies around, say, Italian studies. Then I could ask it to create learning objectives and questions based on those case studies, and then a rubric to assess a discussion. So I can kind of keep building on that a little bit. And I'm just going to give you an example of a case study here now. So again, you'll see some of the same approaches to prompting. I didn't use a persona in this case develop a concise case study examining outdoor recreation management in BC, Canada, discuss how various stakeholders approach this. I asked it to highlight a few balances, ensure the case study is educational and suitable for a first year university course. Another thing that I did with this prompt and I tend to do with my prompts is I get the generative AI to help me with the prompt. So I put in a prompt that's okay, and I asked ChatGPT, improve this prompt so that I can get a better output. And usually it provides more details for me. So let's develop that case study. So now it's writing out the case study. It seems to have scraped some data about BC. It's talking about various stakeholders government agents, it, it understands things like BC parks, local businesses. Of course, I would need to take some time and understand the quality of this output, but it can start helping me create a case. Um, but the last piece around generating resources is in some cases, I think we're starting to move beyond chatbots. I'm just going to go into the worksheet here and grab you an example. We're starting to move beyond chatbots and we're also starting to move beyond prompting. And what I'm sharing here is a application. It's a proof of concept developed out of McMaster University and it's using something called Gen AI agents. So rather than just one large language model now, or one chatbot, it's calling on multiple different agents or chatbots 
to create the output. I don't quite know the back end here, but it might have one agent who specializes in pedagogy, another agent in writing, and imagine these different kind of bots building this out. So the other thing to notice about this is we've moved away from prompting. So if I wanted to create an assessment here, instead of prompting now, I'm using fields. So for this one, I'm going to ask it to create, let's say an essay, I can select my discipline. So let's do an essay in the scholarship of teaching and learning level of study now, we'll call it post-grad. Um, I'm not going to add a topic here. Select the type of assessment. I can choose formative or summative. I'm going to choose a formative assessment. Learning taxonomy or model. Now, this is just giving me Bloom's taxonomy in this case. I'm going to use analyze and we'll generate the output there. So I think this is interesting because right now we're kind of at an MS-DOS stage with these tools. It will be really interesting to see the type of applications that are coming out. And for the average end user, for the average faculty or student user, the extent the prompts are important. We expect I expect the prompts will be important for the developers of these tools, but for the end users, this may change quite a bit. And here's the output we're getting. So we're getting learning objectives that are quite good. We're getting the assessment format. It's giving me the questions and tasks. It's a little bit generic, you'll see. It's asking about generally subtle. It's giving me assessment criteria and a rubric to work with. So again, just giving that an example of where we might be going with some of these material, with some of these approaches. And now it's over to you. So what I'd like you to do is to, probably a nice break from me talking too, is to spend five minutes, see if you can create a, a case study for your own disciplinary. Let me just give you three minutes, actually. I'll keep it short. Play a little bit with the tool. See if you can use the prompts I shared with you and create a case study. Um, try out that actor model of prompting as you do that, or you can just put in the prompt that I have on the specific, on the worksheet. And I'll share the worksheet with you in the chat now as well, if you'd like to do that. Great, so what I'll ask you to do is if you can put the results, a word or two about the results of the output you got into the chat. What was the quality like? Was it lacking? Um, was there you know, anything missing? Was it high quality and so on? I'll just get you to do that for a second. And then we're going to jump in and uh, talk about three ways that Gen AI is being used in the context of higher ed. Great. So to finish things off, I want to talk a little bit about three ways Gen AI is changing. And Camilla mentions her result was quite generic. Thanks, Camilla. Um, three ways that Gen AI is starting to change higher education. And I'm sure there's lots of ways. These are three of the key ways that I think we're seeing now. One is personalized learning. Um, th there's an opportunity, and I'll give the example with my son. I'm not a huge fan of doing homework with my son. I don't tell him that. He's in grade eight. Uh, one of the things that I do now is if he comes home with notes and needs to study for an exam, I take a picture of the note, his scribbled notes. I upload that picture to chat GPT-4 and I say, act as a tutor. I'm studying for this exam. Use these notes, ask me questions one by one to gauge my understanding and help me understand the subject area. And he can sit with it for an hour and learn about Mesopotamia, for example, taking you back to grade eight there. Um, so again, this is really interesting in terms of a tutorial tool. And this is from Benjamin Bloom. Benjamin Bloom um, wrote about the Two Sigma problem in the 1980s. And what Benjamin Bloom found in his work, in his research, was that 
when he compared students who learned by tutoring one on one or one on two compared to a conventional classroom, the students who were tutored achieved two standard of deviations above the students in a conventional classroom. So what can it mean for our teaching to have ubiquitous tutoring? Um, right now, you know, these tools are still hallucinating and making errors, but this could really change how we think about teaching. And this is just an example of a tutoring prompt. I won't run it right now, but act as an expert tutor with a PhD in strategic management and go through these questions one by one. What we're also seeing though now is lots of different tutoring tools. So Contact North, the Australian, or sorry, the Ontario Organization of Higher Education now has custom tutoring tools. Tony Bates, who writes about online learning, has created a custom tutoring tool based on his knowledge. Saul Khan from the Khan Academy has released Khan Mingo. And I think more and more we're going to see these tutoring tools that are available. But a fun experiment now is to kind of play with these tools. Use this prompt. I put it on the worksheet. Play with that. See how it tutors you in your own discipline. And Malik, in his recent book, I really like this, talks about the idea of linking this tutoring capability of Gen AI and the flipped classroom. So asking what would it be like in our teaching if we had a tutoring prompt or a tutoring tool that students were using before the classroom to learn the specific concept coming into the classroom and focusing on practice, mentorship, interaction, active learning, this is a useful approach. I mean, we've already seen that the flipped classroom in higher education across disciplines tends to result in higher achievement. In addition, I think it helps us deal with some of our academic integrity issues. Secondly is co-creation. And Generative AI is starting to really challenge some of our notions of creativity. This is from Moloch, who I'm leaning on a lot for this workshop. Large language models are connection machines. They're trained by generating relationships between tokens that may seem unrelated to humans, but represent some deeper meaning. So we're, I'm sure many of you are starting to use this for creative purposes. Many of our students are but it's turning, these are turning into really powerful tools for creativity. And I'm not sure if you've ever seen an alternative use test. An alternative use test is where you take an object and you try to come up with as many uses for it that aren't its original function. So for example, what can you do with a toothbrush that's not brushing your teeth? So a human can come up with maybe 20 or 30 of those in a couple minutes. ChatGPT can come up with hundreds, if not thousands in two minutes. So I ran this through. These are some of the examples it came up with. Uh, and I just find these so creative and kind of funny. Dusting tool for small statues, I think is my favorite one. A seed planter, spacing tools for hanging pictures, a frother for small amounts of liquid and a miniature rake for Zen gardens. So what does this mean in the creative process and how we get our students to be creative? In a recent workshop, I was in a faculty member who teaches communicating science, talked about allowing her students to use Gen AI as a creator with no restrictions. So they could use Gen AI to help communicate a scientific concept publicly. And what she mentioned is that the creativity was absolutely amazing. So they were creating podcasts, children's storybook, and just listening to her talk about it, she was so excited to read the output. So what does it mean for our teaching in the creative space? The third way is the idea of evaluative judgment. But right now, we know that these models hallucinate, they make errors. And in those errors, there comes, there is a productive learning space right now. Regardless of that, even when they make less errors, we know that these tools have built in biases, they're drawing on specific perspectives. So 
how can we leverage this to develop assignments? And this is from Behrman et al. They wrote a paper called Developing Evaluative Judgment in the Time of Generative AI, and noting there's a deep need when working with generative AI for students to recognize the quality of its output as they can often appear plausible and relevant even when they may be unsuitable and kind of referring back to that UNESCO flowchart that I shared. So what can we do in our classes to get students to analyze the output of generative AI critically? This is an example from Yale. This professor, Justin Farrell, had students pose a question relevant to a problem statement and then annotate the result that came out of ChatGPT. And I really like these annotations. What in the AI output might be inaccurate? What in the AI output might be misleading, incomplete, or even unethical? So thinking about your teaching context, what sort of annotation, what sort of evaluation can students do on the specific output of generative AI? That brings me to the end of Gen AI 101, and I wanted to open it up now for discussions, maybe share how you're using Gen AI. Um, hopefully this was a good introduction for some of you who haven't had a chance to play with it yet, but I'm also open to hearing how you're using it for teaching within your classroom.